Okay, so um, welcome everyone to our um, last session for this book club. So today I will be presenting on how um, to release a package and in particular to submit your packages or well, a single package to CRAN. So hopefully from this session, we will learn something so that we can eventually submit our packages to CRAN. And before we um, know why we submit to, before we know how to submit the package to CRAN, I think it's better to understand why it is even necessary to submit the package to CRAN and to understand the requirements for CRAN submission and also recognize the steps um, needed to do before and after the submission and afterwards, well, God forbids, but it's very likely to happen, understand what to do in case of submission failure. So first of all, why bother submit the CRAN at all? There are three reasons. So it includes, but for sure not limited to discoverability, is of installation and stamp of authenticity and also quality. I think well, personally, when I was still very new to R, it's, um, I always have a second thought when installing packages from GitHub because like, I don't know who the hell is uh, writing the package. Of course, that's not a guarantee that uh, it's, it's not an indicator of the package quality, but I think to uh, many people, including myself in the past, um, having your package available in CRAN gave a certain uh, level of quality guarantee. And of course, by taking all of those into consideration, those advantages may increase the number of users using your R package. So there are several steps that uh, has to be done. Question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. sure. So, so like, um, um, one sometime I want to, I'm looking for the side note for the creation of the packet for installation. Sometime I will see that a package is unavailable on CRAN, but um, it is also, you can install it from GitHub because there are some updates. Um, so what do you guys recommend? Like, um, uh, because the update may not have been in, on CRAN, so someone can just install the GitHub version. So what is the, uh, is there any disadvantage that um, there must be some bugs and it has not been verified from CRAN? It could be because um, I use a lot of packages in Bioconductor and this, so basically Bioconductor is like CRAN, but for biology or bioinformatics. Yes. And often the case when I, want to use the new features, it's only available in the GitHub version, but I really needed um, those new features. So I just installed the GitHub version then. But in that case, I already know who the author of the package is, so I trust that um, they write the package to a certain degree of quality. And I think there are several people who didn't even bother submitting to CRAN for various reasons. I think the reasons is quite obvious if, um, if you read this later version of this package, like if, um, on the part of um, submission to failure, maybe that's what triggers or traumatizes people. I don't know. I haven't submit one, so I cannot say for sure. Okay, okay. Sure. Yeah, I think the main the main thing that you, that you need to take care is, um, especially if a package is a dependence to other packages, because if you are installing a, you need to understand that the version that is usually hosted on, on GitHub is a development version. So it can, it, can, it could have implemented like uh, breaking changes that other package, packages that depends on, on this particular package are not aware. So, um, every time you install a development version of a package, you can break other packages if they depend on, on that package. That, that's the main thing that, that 
that, that you need to take care is if you are installing a GitHub version of a package that is available on Chrome. If you are installing a package that isn't available in Chrome at, at all, then it's more about you um, you checking the quality if you consider that, that package a good a good quality code. And, and, that, and, the, and that's interesting to understand that if you understand the, the package development life cycle, it's easier for you to, to, to look to the code at GitHub and say, oh, this is a well-designed package. It's a well-maintained, even if it's not on, on GitHub. And, and you can also say, oh, this, this is just crap. Don't, don't install that thing on, on your computer. <laughs> it also has ramifications for Shiny mm -hmm. apps too, uh, because when you, or at least when you put it to Shiny apps IO, because they're making, they're installing all, it's on another machine. So they're creating a, an image so they're pulling packages. Um, and sometimes I've run into where I use um, one function, but I can't use it with my Shiny app uh, because it, it can't. There are some ways around it, perhaps, uh, but you just got to be cautious, too, because um, it may not and may not work with your Shiny app if you want to get it to Shiny apps IO. Yeah, if, if you are developing code that depends on, on code that is, is not released on Chrome, you, you probably won't be able to release your code to, to general, general availability. All right, thank you all for the answer. All right, so um, yeah, steps to releasing an R package. So first of all, pick your version number. So it, um, it has been discussed in uh, chapter eight and then afterwards um, run and document the results of your RCMD check, the errors, the warnings and the notes. And so there are several grant policies that has to be um, checked manually so we have to uh, check on this, but it's not, well, as far as I know, it's actually not something that's very complicated. And afterwards, updating the, um, your readme and news file, finally submit the grant, and last but not least, publicize your package. Did I got disconnected? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. You were saying the the, last, the, the the publicized package and, and just get, got stuck. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sharing again. Yeah. I noticed it because um, like your faces are disappearing. So mm, why am I talking only to my screen? Okay. <laughs> All right. So regarding the versioning, so it should follow this convention, the major.minor.patch.dev, and it, we have also discussed this previously in chapter eight. So I think the most important thing that has to be kept in mind is, especially if you are incrementing the major version of the package, so this um, numbers, these conventions are not random numbers. They do have a meaning. So for example, you increment your major version number, especially if you're introducing changes that are not backward compatible and it may affect many users. So it is important because if your package is not backward compatible, then maybe there are other packages um, that depends on your package 
and there's a possibility that the update in your package may break the function in other packages. And another um, another implication of go changing this um, major version. Also, for example, if we when you write a package, then you go to the version 1.0.0, then it indicates feature completeness and stable API. Um, this being said, I'm not entirely sure how this, how feature completeness and stable API can be defined though, because for example, in Python, in scikit-learn, it, it's, it's already around for years but I think now it's version 0 0.21. So it's nowhere uh, near version one. So I'm not entirely sure uh, like how many years it will take until uh, the developers consider it um, version 1.0.0 worthy. But anyway, so for changes in minor version, it's if you um, introduce bug fixes, new features, and a slight changes in the backward compatibility. For the for patch, it's for bug fixes and dev in development. And note that the version numbers are not limited to 0 to 9. So for example, for your minor version, for if you have like nine minor version changes, then it doesn't mean that your only option for the next change is you have to change your major version, but it can go to 0 0.10, 0 0.11, whatever. So it's feel free to increment the, um, the version number, of course, as, um, as appropriate. And yeah. And yeah, for the um, dev version, it's usually indicated with a 9,000. It has, I think this is just a convention to indicate that um, this package is really in, still in development. And I think if you use the version number 9,000, it becomes so conspicuous that you would easily notice that um, the package version is still in development. All right, so for the backward compatibility, again, this is the most important difference between major and minor version changes. Sometimes this is a necessary evil, maybe because um, the current you want to fix the bad coding habits that the past you uh, did. I think this is really um, the story of my life. And maybe you want to introduce a cleaner API and maybe you also want to implement a new features that doesn't play really well with your old functions. So if you think this is um, necessary, then um, by any means, feel free to introduce the changes. However, um, the best practice is to introduce the changes uh, gradually. I think if you use tidy first, the most um, obvious example that I can think of is for the spread and uh, gather from tidyr. Then it becomes superseded and um, we have to pivot longer and pivot wider. So the function, the, both the functions are still there, but you will receive the warning if you use the old or the new functions. Okay, so if you want to introduce backward incompatible changes, don't immediately remove a function or an argument of a function. So um, we can first deprecate the function and just remove it at the next major release because again, if you increment your major version, then it means you're introducing um, changes that may potentially uh, break your backward compatibility. So there is a, um, so this is the example if you want to deprecate a function. And if you want to deprecate an argument of a function, um, you can refer to the uh, book. That's, 
Okay. But if you're thinking of deprecating a lot of code, then I would say maybe just consider creating um, a whole new F function. Okay, for submission process. I think um, this is very important to remember for all of us that CRAN is staffed by volunteers. I think there are only three volunteers that, and all of them have full-time jobs. So um, I try to, you know, um, think in their shoes as much as I can. Maybe if they uh, give like a short to the point answer, it's because that's the only time that they have to give the response, maybe. But anyway, if you uh, submit your package and then you receive a comments, you can um, submit the submission comments in the cran commentsmd And this is also, this file is also important. So if you submit a package and then there's something that you have to fix, then you can put, I will explain it later as well, um, a new header, a top level header, and then label it with resubmission. And in the resubmission, then you can list what are the changes that you have done in response to the recommendations to your submission errors. But um, before you, uh, before that, so there, in the CRAN comments, there are three um, points that has to be um, noted. So for the test environments, so this is for the what platforms that you um, use to check the package and by platform is the OS. And for the check results, make sure that there are no errors or warnings or else the um, the CRAN volunteers will not even bother looking at the package. And also, last but not least, the reverse dependencies. Okay, so first of all, you need to ensure that your package pass check with the R development branch. And because CRAN will um, build your package on these four platforms, so Windows, OS X, Linux and Solaris, then you need to make reasonable efforts for your app package to pass the check on at least two platforms, or I think, um, I'm not entirely sure whether I can say at least two, because I think if you can um, make your package pass the check on all platforms, I think that's um, the best deal but I'm not entirely sure that whether you can just like make like one and just focus on the other three, for example. I'm not sure. All right, and for checking your check results, we have also discussed this before in uh, chapter 19. So again, fix all errors and warnings of your package or else it will not be accepted by CRAN. And if you receive a note, so a note doesn't have to be fixed, but still you need to eliminate as many notes as possible. But if you can eliminate the note, just document it in the CRAN comments.md and maybe um, list a brief reasons why um, like why you don't really bother to eliminate all the nodes. Okay, and I think this is one of the most important um, thing. If a lot of, if you develop a package that many package um, depended upon. So of course it's great that um, the changes in your package do not break other packages that depends on yours. However, if it happens, so the first thing that uh, we can do is to run this function, devtools, 
left that check, so reverse dependencies check, because it will simplify the process. So it will install the uh, the packages that depends on your package and all the dependencies, and then it will try to run um, the functions in those package um, with the current version of your package. And if any packages fail, I think this is a good reminder that we should give the package authors time to fix the problem before you submit your package to CRAN. Because I think um, if a package um, that is in CRAN, uh, when it's checked, then it returns an error and the authors cannot be um, contact, then I think within a few weeks notice, then the package will be removed from CRAN. So I think it's a really good idea to, uh, to take other people into consideration as well. Yeah, it's not, it's not exactly remove it, it's or orphan. The, the code stays there, but uh, mm -hmm. it will, will be, be checked as not maintained for some time and then in the, you know, especially, especially when R changes version, if the code don't run on the new version, then they, they archive the code. But if it's just that the code's not maintained, but it's still working, they still maintain there, but mark the, that as orphaned. Hmm. All right, thanks. Okay. So regarding the most common problems of um, submitting to trend. So first is that um, the authors did not use stable emails. And in, in consequence, the authors cannot be contacted by CRAN. So this is um, very important because if your package has an error and the CRAN cannot um, reach you at all, and the errors is not fixed, I think it is unavoidable for the uh, CRAN team to uh, not remove your package from CRAN or remove archive. Not sure. All right, and if you are using um, external code, external source code, so you have to identify the copyright holders in description. So you should specify um, who owns those external source code. And afterwards, um, for checking whether your package can work across platforms, you have to do it to make an effort to ensure that the package can work across platforms. And I think Lucio introduced this one package that can automatically build a Docker image um, to check the um, whether the package can be built across um, OS. Do yeah, it was the R hub. R hub. I can. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. I can yeah. send it in the, on the on the chat. Oh yeah, please. I was looking at the chat from previous weeks, but I cannot find it. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, I. It is obvious um, that I haven't tried it, but it sounds it will help um, with this uh, with this part a lot. Okay, and apparently, Cran doesn't like if you if your package make external changes without explicit user permission, such as um, writing file. So maybe um, uh, you can think of something as simple as um, your package will write or create a directory without any of your permission. Apparently, um, the current team doesn't like that. So if you um, are thinking of uh, making a function for that, maybe always um, ask for permission in your function. And then to send information over the internet, I think this is because when the CRAN team is building the package, then it's not connected to the internet and then it will cause an error. 
So just make sure um, that your package doesn't um, doesn't rely on this. Okay, and regarding updates, you should just submit updates every one to two months. So it's not like um, a git commit where you can um, send an update every I don't know, every sentence. So just submit an update whenever it really matters. All right, and then for um, okay for readme and news. So um, coming from users user of uh, many art package, I think um, a readme is a very important indicator for me of um, a package quality because if in the readme file it explains a bit on what the package actually does and how to use the package like there's a paragraph or a code block that explains how the package can be used from end to end i think it will greatly improve the likelihood of my using the package so i think this is um, a good reminder for me as well if you if i want to make a package then always to make sure that the readme will be as informative as possible. And also we should include installation instructions, uh, like, um, you know, the um, install.packages and then the name of your uh, package. So make it as simple as possible for new uh, potential new users to use your, to install and use your package. All right. and. Um, news.md file. So we can use the top level heading for each updated version. And by convention, most recent version should go at the top. And if an item like a bug fix or um, addition of new features is related to an issue or a pull request in GitHub, then include relevant information so that um, it is easy to navigate to that issue or that, to that um, pull request. And if you have done all of the preceding steps, finally you can run this DevTools release function. And what you have to do is to check and build for one last time and also ask yes or no questions to verify that you follow the best practices. And finally, upload the package bundle to client submission forms, including the comments in clientcommands.md. And afterwards, after you're submitting, then you can wait for a, a notice. And if um, if in case you receive a notification that your submission fails, well, that is a, quite a lengthy a section already in the um, in the R packages book, especially regarding take a deep breath and just be kind. And I guess um, we just we should really focus on the technical problems, and then fix as many problems as possible instead of um, making a discussion because it is very likely that it will waste um, both the current team and our time as well. And after we think we have um, fixed the identified problems, then we can rerun the DevTools check to make sure we didn't inadvertently introduce new problems because I think this is very frequently um, happen. You seal a leak, then a leak appears somewhere else. And yeah, so this is uh, an important part. 
So if you're, if in case of resubmission at a resubmission section at the top of the current command.md and try to list all the changes that you made or maybe just if you think um, that a change is not uh, feasible, I'm not sure of an example though, but I think um, it, it's sort of you can negotiate um, your, you can bargain your position, maybe, not sure. Okay, and afterwards, you can run DevTools submit CRAN to resubmit the package. And the difference with the previous function, the, um, where was it? The sub, uh, DevTools release is that the sub, the submit grant will not ask again this uh, yes no questions to verify that you follow the best practices. But other than that, it's all the same. All right. And if you have um, published your package, you have maybe you have finally succeeded. Um, getting your package grant to buy conductor or maybe still in GitHub, we um, we can announce the package in maybe you have a blog in Twitter with the hashtag um, our stats, our packages mailing list. Well, this one I haven't used it, nor I know of its existence before this, so. This is something that I um, I can try, and I think we have seen um, such website a lot. So apparently, well, not, so this uh, package down um, package can actually ease um, the is the process of making a website for your package because it basically uses um, everything that your package already has, provided that you have made it, of course. So we can just run these two functions, use this, use package down, and then afterwards package down build site. And it will um, create um, two folders. So the docs, it's where the website uh, resides and the um, all the documentations in the main folder will be generated as the function reference and the vignettes that you have in the vignette folder will be rendered into articles. So, and an example, so this is the example of the um, package down website. As you can see, it looks very nice. And the fact that it actually uses um, everything that's already in there, if you follow the good package development practice, if you document um, the function of your package, give a vignette, then all the building blocks that is necessary to build your package website is already there. So apparently my headset is run out of battery. So yeah, I'll off to get a headphone. Okay. I love package down even for just internal reference. Yeah, that, that, that's I exactly don't share it with anyone. I go, I look at I'm it very well. Yeah, yeah. If, if you are already documenting your stuff, okay. it will be already there. So, you just have to, it's uh, really easy. It's really yeah, convenient. That is, uh, one moment. Um, I cannot hear you. Okay. Are you hearing us? It's okay. Can anyone try to speak? 
Yeah, I'm hearing you, Mikael. We can hear you. How are you? I think you are hearing us. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, yeah. Now yeah. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Well, one consideration that I, uh, especially in in the part of um, being patient with the cream chain. I think especially for people that is already used with the an academic publishing process where, where you have to always have this kind, this kind of feedback. You send your work, um, someone fr throw a lot of stuff back to you that you need to, to get right and then send again. I think that they approach, sometimes they approach the, the package release cycle with the same mentality. And, and, and for people that is more used with the traditional software release pack processes, and they are not um, used with external, external judgment of the code quality and stuff like that. So people usually get really mad with the crane comment. But for people that is more used with the academic re release process, it's, it's okay. I think it's, it's much lighter than some <laughs> some peer review <laughs> peer reviewed works at, at least if, what I have seen on the world. Yeah, I'm curious though for other uh, programming language, is there an equivalent to this um, volunteers for CRAN or is R the only programming language that has such board? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, for example, for JavaScript, no, no JS, they have this NPM where you, you it's the command that you use to install the package. Um, anyone can send any code for it. So if I create a package now, I can send that and I can update tomorrow. I can retrieve it and any day I can remove the code. So for, for Python is more or less the same on the, on the Py, Py, Py P. Yeah. IP. Yeah, yeah. But anyone can send code anytime, update code anytime. Yeah, but so they, they don't have this this assurance that the code will will be there tomorrow, that the code will will be tested by someone else, things like that. Okay. So I guess I so mean in that sense. I think you're on the reproducibility for the not not reproduce, but the the assurance that this your the software will be available. Kren tries to to be more rigorous on that, especially making sure that the package follows the open source licenses and things like that. So a, a, anyone can really use the code. And even if someone removes the code from Kren, since it's open source, other person can upload it or, or, or change the maintenance. Yeah, and I guess in that sense, um... If anything, shouldn't we like be grateful for this volunteers for CRAN? Yeah, for sure. Especially nowadays that GitHub is so ubiquitous because if you don't want to wait for the CRAN process, you, you just install from GitHub. So 90% of the packages would be on GitHub. So if you don't bother with the rigor rigorosity of CRAN, just, just install from GitHub. And, and I also can comment comment on the bioconductor side of things that they had. They have a different approach from CRAM because they they are more interested on the reproducibility reproducibility issues. So they are more interested on having all the packages working together in a specific time of moment than than just assuring the individual quality of packages. So if if you, if you, if someone has used a bioconductor, you see that bioconductor has um, the versions. For example, if you, you are using uh, bioconductor version one point thirteen, you will have all the packages of bioconductor following the same um, a specific version that that are tested together, that everything is used to test together, even if they are not updated, and they 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 release a new 
build, I think every six months. Yep. And then they update all the packages at once on that release window. So they are more, more interested on, on making everything working together on a specific window of time. And then, but, but during the, that window of time, um, the release cycle is much more free. Like the, the auto can send anything to back and do to the update and thing, but they have a specific date where the package will be frozen. So they, 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 there are other repositories with different archives, with different uh, priorities. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I started to see um, our open, open science community created this R universe. And I don't know if anyone else has seen it, that they are hosting, um, like a, it's a space for individual um, publishers like uh, communities or individual maintainer of packages that, that can they can maintain their their package there or, or just link to their GitHub profiles things like that so so you can find all the all the package from a specific community or a specific um, author mm. yeah that also our open science has a uh, has a, yeah, there are open science um, GitHub page. You, you can create a package and send the, the package to the R open site and they will maintain the package for you. They will host that, that on their, on their um, uh, GitHub. You, you will be just the auto, the, the community will maintain your package after you develop. So they, but they have um, more stricter policies on how to develop the package on, how to review the the, the, the packages? Oh, that sounds. I think really we also have a, a book about package development. Hmm. So Corocron is not the only the only place that a package can live, but if you want your package to be reached by a wi wider audience, especially from people that is starting the art journey, CREN is the primary resource that, that you need to, to aim if, if you want general availability of your package. Yeah, that's very true. And this is also all, everything that this bug focus and all the specs that dev tools use this they just exist to exist to make this process easier and it's actually pretty easy if you follow everything um it, it's harder to think about your code and, <laughs> and develop your own code than just following the steps on the on the book i'd forgotten about that so thanks for reminding me <laughs> that our universe, the, that I'd seen some news about it and then didn't follow up. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's there. I remember now. And for the Embran, it's only, so for the Embran, it's only like a time machine for our packages, right? So it's not like necessarily a central repo for our packages. Which one you said? Uh, our bind. Embran. So I think it's by oh. Microsoft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, Embran. They have they have these snapshots that they save a specific date, right? I haven't used it actually, but I, I already saw it. It's actually because Microsoft actually has a different version of R that they have, they use different, um, like the algebraic processing stuff inside R. It's different from the open source version. It's like a closed source code inside R. Um, so they started maintaining the, the versions that, of package that, that are optimized to that code, but then they started to making it like, a, uh, is that exact copy of Chrome, but I, I haven't used it for anything. But yeah, they have this 
these snapshots, but actually our, our studio now is also ho hosting a, a snapshot in versus the our studio public package manager, I think. Studio. Where you can you can set a specific date. Oh, I want to download this the package the way it was on date X, and you can access that. Actually, I, I'm actually using a lot this our Studio Public Package Manager, especially because they are making available um, binary version of our packages for Linux, because cron don't host binary oh. versions of of Linux. Package. They, they just host the source code and you have to build it on your own machine. So usually installing our package on Linux machine take a lot of time. Yeah. And the R Studio package manager allows you to download already compiled code. So at least for the, um, the main distributions of Linux, you can download. The, it's, it's much faster to install code from this repo. Let me find it. But is the package manager um, freely available, or is it like a component of yeah, their it, paid service? Exactly because it's the name, the naming is really confusing. Because R Studio the Enterprise has a product called R Studio Package Manager. There is a product for enterprises to create, like creating their own cron inside the organization and hosting um, Python and R. Uh, libraries inside an organization, distributing it inside an organization. But there's also this R Studio Public Package Manager that is a different thing. <laughs> okay. But yeah, the, the naming is really confusing. It can, I, okay, I, I found it. Yeah, I'll use, yeah, I'll use send the R Studio Package Manager here. Um, yeah. Lisio, um, I missed what you said about this. Um, I don't know what it is. This R Open Science Universe. What is it like? Is it like Crown or what it is? Um, it's a completely different thing. It's more like a, I wouldn't say a, a marketplace or a social media platform where the developers host their packages or or create a profile and link the like like GitHub itself, but specific for um they are our community i would say I, I i don't really follow the project closely but okay. I, I i have seen a lot of traction about about it on okay. twitter and another thing but, but i um like a, anyone can create your you can create your profile there and you can host your packages there um and even even if they are just on github or if they are on chrome bioconductor Actually, like Bioconductor has a profile inside our universe. It's a really, new, it's kind of new project. Um, but but outside of this our universe, there is the our open science community. The, the, there is a community um, about guaranteeing the open science <laughs> environment in R. So they host a lot of packages also there. And they have strict guidelines about the quality of of packages also. And they have, uh, especially the R open, open Science community there, they have a specific re review process of that that assemble assemb that's more close to the academic review process about how they review the code and the documentation of packages. And another comment that I would like to address, it's especially when, when Mikael talked about um, the, the, the versioning problem, like the, you will see that re really old software that maybe never re re reached uh, 
well, 1.0 version. Mo mostly, I would say that they don't want to 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 reach the the 1.0 version because they don't want to to have any anyone waiting a guarantee that the code will work. You, mm. the, it's just a guarantee that that can change the code in time and no one will, will care like that. Because if you, if you release a 1.0 version, people will start to build other things on top of your code and they will wait that you maintain that you, it's more about expectations of the community. Okay. Let's say. So it's like they don't want people to take them accountable. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the word, yeah. <laughs> I think hmm. it's, that's interesting yeah especially yeah. especially if you try to understand the kind of organization that is developing or backing that code maybe you can have an idea of what they, they are expecting <laughs> of the community or, or who is maintaining the code I mean could you imagine building a package you know and then everyone's using it and you have like just all sorts of like and trying to maintain you know keep up with that would be overwhelming so i could see it in some instances yeah, yeah especially if you move away from that code you like you develop your package and then you have uh, I, I don't care more you know about that and i just move into other projects and then if you release it in a 1.0 version people will expect that you will maintain update or you know, that fix happened, book bugs. That like happened this. with a package I really relied on, the Qualtrics package. You know, that went silent for a while. And um, OpenSci, uh, Julia uh, picked it up. Um, but I was so, I was like, oh, I couldn't wait to be able to pull API access from Qualtrics rather than downloading CSV files. But that went dormant for a while. I was like, oh. <laughs> It was off yeah, the, it was the one thing about open source software yeah. for sure. It can go away. <laughs> yeah, but but the, the other yeah, good so. thing is that you can get this code and you can get the code of pack and release your own package, updating yeah. if if you want. But actually, it's not that easy, but it's possible. <laughs> but, those API, um, but yeah, those API ones. I, I don't know what I'm reading. <laughs> I'm glad someone else is yeah. doing it. Yeah. But yeah, I can imagine that 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 it happens a lot, especially especially on on these like vo volatile resources like APIs and and the web web hooks and things like that. I can imagine that all the time they are changing and the web changes really fast. I know because I would like to help out, but I'm like I, I don't know what's happening. Here, so yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> Yeah, science, no, none of us is really releasing a package right now. We don't have much comments on the actual release process. But, but the, the, it's, all, it's also important to address that after releasing, it's really important the, the after, um, after market of releasing, that is the main maintenance. It's, it's, it could be a burden for a lot of people, but it's, it's important to... Especially if you decide to really release a package on Chrome, it there is an assumption that you will maintain it for at least at least like a, you build a community to to maintain uh, the package uh, on a community way. Yeah, that's that, that, true. that that's something that this our open science team tries try to mitigate because after you release your package as an our open side side package. Um, the community can, if you just throw it away, the community will, will at least be able to update or, or have a decision processes around it. Yeah, um, Michael, in the, um, the uh, presentation, you said like um, maintaining like a update the package is like every two months or is, is that right? Oh, it's for the Wait. frequency of your submission. So it doesn't overload the clan volunteers, which I think really makes sense, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, Chrome don't don't expect you to be updating your package like every week. <laughs> they they don't don't really 
they don't encourage this this behavior they would they would would wait like one month two months you you get a lot of uh, additions and then send it all by one in one way okay well if it is like critical changes you may feel to send it right yeah you, you if, if it's a bug fix you can send it on the following day but you are more likely to receive an email asking oh are you sure that you you are already updating the, the code that you sent yesterday <laughs> but if it's a critical bug fix yeah you, you you would just have to ask to answer an email saying yeah it's a it's important there was a uh, a bug in, on the on the last release and i need to to and, and then they already patched it so you you would have to write any kind of comment around it but i think if it's a bug it's it's really okay and regarding the maintainer yeah i think it's also something that we have to remember because um just just this week i want to use a package that i I have used this package in the past and I really liked it. And the package was only available in GitHub. And then I search the author's GitHub repo and I find the repo was missing. And fortunately I can um, reach the um, author of the package and the author just said, well, I don't work this on anymore. I have moved on and I don't think I can maintain the package. Hence I removed the package from uh, I remove uh, the repo. And I think this is a very important thing because maintaining is not an easy task, especially if you are working on something else. And I mean, if you see something interesting, then just immediately fork it <laughs> and try to have it yeah. in your repo. Yeah, this is a, I mean, I'm very lucky that the author can still respond and I can use the package. Yeah, for sure. sure. Elf, I yeah. think. Yeah. That's a great quote, Mikhail. Just fork it. <laughs> just for, yeah, yeah, I mean, a... just fork it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that there isn't a, a easy, an easy solution for the for this maintenance problem, because especially with open source software that is not ba baked by a by an, an enterprise it's the personal time of the developer that it's going to maintenance and sometimes it's it's on the free free time of the de developer so it's hard to address that and the same thing is valid for academic software because sometimes you you have a grant for writing a project but I don't really know of projects that have grains for maintaining current projects. You have to, the, the academic uh, way, actually it's better for you to abandon a project and starting a new project than, than stay all your career improving the same project. So you see a lot of programs that, that they are the new version, but they, but they have another name, they have another, <laughs> another grains related. So in the bio, Informatics community, it's really, it's really common. Actually, yeah. I, I saw for the first time last year uh, a specific grant for for this kind of maintenance projects that that was from the Zuckerberg Shen Initiative. Oh, yeah. They actually they are now backing a lot of um, R packages, especially on the bioconductor community. They they have a um, long term support for pack like four years five years support for the maintainers of the packages so it's maybe you you see more of that in the future yeah that's true and i think the r open science it seems to be a good fit for you know a student projects that will uh, potentially um, result in a package because i mean if the student goes then who would ever maintain this package and doesn't that mean that the package is not useful or it's not um, of a good quality but yeah if it seems a good solution yeah i also agree if if you are just actually because non 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 pi would 
would be granting or would, would be maintaining software all the way. So if you have software related with a PhD thesis or something, it's a good fit on the on the European science community. And also, if you, someone is is searching places to publish um, our our code, our, um, our academic journals that that are focused on on our code nowadays, um, there is the the Journal of Open Sci Soft Journal of Open Source Software J O S S that they have a a, a public and open um peer review process that actually they do everything on github they you you send your github repo and they comment on the github repo and they do all the release process on the github repo and the github repo itself becomes the the source code of the of the the article <laughs> it's a it's a nice it's a modern approach to to software that is also the the factor of thousand uh, f, f, f thousand research that they have a specific um, session for our packages and by conductor packages. It's, it's also good to, to try to publish your package if, if you are trying to, to reach the academic community. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But uh, unfortunately, I think just by design, uh, because uh, I think people spend more effort in making the article instead of the uh, package itself. So I think it's yeah. such such a pity. I mean, and yeah, we cannot really blame the authors because they have to, you know, to put food on the table and just making a GitHub repo <laughs> with a well-documented package doesn't really put food on the table. Incentives. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, for, for sure, for sure, yeah. That that and, and that is, is where things like our the, the R markdown doc development, things like that, is easy sometimes this process because you can write your prose together with the code and maybe can can easy this this process of writing the documentation together with code and together with uh, your academic article or thesis or anything, <laughs> or the, the or other products that are associated with your code. Oh, well, all right. It's already eight past. So, oh. yeah. It's a grad 12, a grade 12 session, everyone. Is it 12 or even 13? I think 13, right? Oh, well, anyway, it's, I think it's one of the few book clubs yeah. that I followed from a beginning to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it, it, it was a great opportunity to be in the session with you guys. And yeah. okay. let's keep in Thank contact. You yeah, let's keep in touch. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Michael. Thank yes. you, Kevin. Nizio. Thank you all. Yeah, and thank you. How's the plan for um, proceeding with the advanced R? Are you still up for it? I'm up. Yeah. Okay. You, we, we were talking about maybe like three weeks. Mm -hmm. get, yeah. I think Sham Shudin is already in a session for advanced R. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Me, I'm already in one of the sessions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we, we can announce. I, I can imagine that actually for advanced R, probably would be more, more people interested. It's I a, think so. Yeah, yeah, it's a more general interest book, so we need to actually announce it and and and, and see for the and and, and have the, the the necessary time for more people to to join and set a, the better time or, or anything. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm def, definitely interested. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And this time works great for me. So. Oh yeah, so do I. So. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. um, else I, I think it's it, it's a ten o'clock now here in my place. I mean, cool. I think it's better oh, to so, have to so have this book club outside. rather than watching Netflix. 
<laughs> okay. It's a much better use of my time. <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm like astounded how much um, I'm, I am surprised, but not surprised how much I learned and picked up, um, you know, just talking about it and seeing someone do it is just amazing. And even when you do the, your own presentation, you're like, wow, I learned a lot. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, for sure. I, um, I learned a lot and it's, it's a great potent to get the detail, especially if you're reading alone and you, you are just mm-hmm. thinking on, on the text itself. But when you discuss the, the topics, it, yeah. So it, yeah, yeah once you start the thing, you understand it more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, especially ha- having to present something. It's yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anytime I'm presenting one of the children, I learn it the most part. I learn from the book because, yeah. Yeah, sure. And I think it's a bad habit of mine that I have to fix that if I encounter a wall of text that uh, when I try to read it in the first pass, it doesn't seem intelligible, then I just gloss over it, whereas it's actually important. And fortunately, <laughs> other people explain it and it makes sense. So yeah, it's really helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. me, I really enjoy um, study session like this. Um, yeah, I <laughs> really, really enjoy it. Yeah, and, and I am also grateful for the opportunity to have it in this format of the R4DS community because if videos w- would be available for the community and I hope it would be useful for more, <laughs> more people actually. And... Oh yeah, it's good like um, like for the last week I didn't attend, I was like, yeah, uh, trying to see what has been discussed. So it's good like um, even if uh, someone missed the recordings that they are also in YouTube, and this is a good way also. And in fact, you can see that in YouTube, you see many people are watching the videos. If you look at it, if you observe. <laughs> so some people, even though they are not attending, they can follow the uh, secret or follow the video recording of the discussions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, people. I have to go now. <laughs> okay, and, thank uh, you very much. See you. All right. Next. All right. Everything going. Um, hopefully, see you in a few weeks. Yeah. Keep in touch and yeah. see you in a few weeks. Bye. You guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>